Okay, as mentioned by Sheila, um, this presentation is based on a work we did last year, focusing on payments for ecosystem services, looking at how to better manage our natural resources. Uh, for this purpose, since it's uh, a very thematically specific month, uh, we are relating the presentation to DRRM and climate change adaptation and management. So the title for this afternoon's presentation is Payment for Ecosystem Services for Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management in the Philippines. The work, as mentioned by Sheila, uh, was done with Ms. R.V. Manihar as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Jan Okpina. So the outline of the presentation is as follows. I'll be going through some uh, details as regards our challenges uh, when we face disaster events in the country, as well as how we look at climate change uh, related risks in our local landscapes. Disaster impact estimates, we go into the need for uh, proper loss and damage accounting. We discuss the issue in terms of TRM planning and budgeting, institutional platform in action, fiscal management. So very much related to what uh, our previous presenters uh, conveyed earlier. So uh, Dr. Ella went into the details as regards our interventions post Yolanda. And uh, Director Bangsal uh, elaborated on fiscal uh, management related issues. My presentation would bridge those two presentations and possibly in the end, discuss a more novel approach uh, in sustaining our financing for DRR related and well, climate change and adaptation mitigation related initiatives. So the second uh, section of the presentation will focus in, on the payment for ecosystem services for climate change and disaster risk mitigation and adaptation. And and then we go into the key takeaways from the study and from related studies uh, focusing on the RR and CC. And then we try to recommend ways to move forward. So as a backdrop, environment degradation or related issues increase climate change and anthropogenic risks. So such include both uh, natural and man-induced related disaster events. Ecosystem condition declines by at least 4% per decade from the UN. This is alarming, especially in the Philippines, when you look at uh, ecological integrity-related concerns. The Philippines tops most of the indices uh, risk-wise you know, that we have, and spe specifically in 2022, uh, among 192 countries, we were on the top spot with regard to um, the computed disaster risk index. So we have extensive damages and casualties from disaster events. And unfortunately, uh, relating that to environment uh, anchored markets, we have inefficient uh, markets on uh, ecological environmental services provision, making PES probably a good option moving forward for alternative approaches you know, when we want to have sustained interventions both at the national and subnational levels. Okay, natural disaster wise, going through the years, the decades and decades of uh, exposure to natural hazards, we see a lot of hydromet related events impacting local populations. But uh, relating that as well to climate change, it's not about uh, the number or the frequency increasing. It's more of intensity uh, of such events increasing. For example, we've encountered uh, first Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, our first uh, super typhoon. And then more recently, 2021, we had Odette uh, also impacting the southern Philippines. Last year, we had Paeng also causing a lot of damages and casualties uh, also in, in Mindanao. So uh, looking at what we've done historically, 
to address such risk exposure, uh, probably we have a lot of room for, for improvement. And I think such would support the presentation earlier by Dr. Kelton. So also, if you're going to look at evidences or numbers, you see on your screen, the biggest numbers damage wise coming from hydrometric related events in the country. So that's for um, the numbers that we've, uh, we've got for the past century or so. And that brings us into another uh, concern. So we've uh, admittedly encountered so many disaster events during the past century. Unfortunately, uh, we have to admit that we have very poor accounting, short as well as long-term related economic impacts of disaster. Now, not only economic, but social, all the dimensions of impacts coming from both natural and man-induced disaster events. So we have short-run as well as long-run disaster impacts. If you, if you look at uh, short-run concerns, we see direct impacts on death, casualties, and destruction of property, disruption of productivity and product flows, so value chains, uh, our supply systems, both at the national and subnational levels, decrease in short-term economic activity, including residual lags. In the long run, we see evidence varying across uh, the different sectors. The evidence is also being diverse from uh, the most positive, uh, because there are beneficial effects of post-disaster interventions, as well as to the most adverse. But again, uh, we do not collect routinely pre- and post-disaster data, which is a very big entry point for intervention. Intergenerational damages and impacts are not being looked at as well. And then the lesser seen uh, benefit coming from post-disaster related activities, which is uh, focusing on creative or innovative post-disaster improvements and growth. So the way we try to build better after a disaster event actually impacts uh, not only the local level, but also the national uh, dynamics uh, growth-wise. So long-term human economic losses, much larger than budget losses. And the World Bank and UN found that prevention spending is more effective than post-disaster spending. So we all know this. We need to invest on preparedness. We have to make our communities more resilient so that uh, whenever disaster events happen, uh, they will incur lesser losses. So we've seen over the years, the national government, as well as the local governments, trying to improve the policy landscape. And we have shifted from us being responsive to proactive you know, uh, provision wise. Unfortunately, we also look at evidences over the years. Um, although we also have devolved so many functions to the local government, our institutional structures, the processes within those institutions and the resulting actions you know, institution wise remain one thing. So we need to do more, not only in terms of what we see on the ground, but also in terms of strengthening the basis for such action. So in the screen, you see the, the national and subnational structure for the RR uh, management. You see some policies that we've uh, uh, passed over the years to augment uh, the provisions for disaster risk reduction management. We see as well um, evidences in terms of institutional action uh, relating this presentation to Dr. Ellis' presentation earlier, you see here the timeline for Yolanda-related interventions post uh, the November event. And then you see down below uh, what we did for ODET, where we, we actually did not see so much improvement you know, from what we did uh, a decade ago for Yolanda. There is also uh, evidence as regard some optimal rebuilding processes for the man, the man induced uh, Marawi disaster event uh, in 2017. So six years after the Marawi siege, 
10 years after the Yolanda event, uh, what evidence of improvement uh, institutional action wise no, do we see right now? I think that's one of the uh, questions that we have uh, in the Q&A section of our Zoom. We have, I think, very weak in inclusivity of national and subnational and sectoral decision making, as well as budgeting processes. So in a few months, we'll be having our barangay elections. And unfortunately, we have thousands and thousands of barangays. Now. They are the closest to communities uh, in terms of governance. But uh, with this very huge uh, responsibility, does not come the required resources. No? and possibly the governance facility for them to do it. So we need augmentation there as well. At the municipal or city levels, they have to do more in terms of bringing in inputs coming from the barangays, coming from the communities in, in their crafting of development programs and plans, as well as in their decision-making and eventual uh, budget. So Director Bangsal uh, elaborated a lot on uh, the fiscal side. So I won't be uh, going into the details of the slide, but uh, suffice it to say that we have a lot of sources for the RM and climate change related interventions, funding wise. So we have both national and subnational uh, sources of funding. Now, on your slide, you see the subnational funding uh, to the left and the national funding to the right. So I think. Uh, Director Bangsal elaborated more on the NDRIMF, the National DRR Fund. Uh, to your left, you see um, the utilization rate for the local DRR Fund. 5% of regular revenues from our local governments being put into an item specifically for disaster risk reduction management related expenses. 70% of that for mitigation related expenses, 30% for QRF or quick response. And to the right, you see how we um, farm out the national level funding for the RRM coming from our, climb, our national DRR funds. The SWD is the biggest recipient, followed by, you see here, DEPED, uh, the PWH, you know, institutions that are very much integrated in terms of our action post disaster events. So the other DRR related challenges are presented in the slide. Institutional leadership and subnational structure needing augmentation, fiscal planning and budgeting also needing augmentation, resource mobilization and procurement being articulated by our stakeholders as entry points for more efficient intervention, funding sourcing and utilization, weak monitoring and evaluation, both of fund use and reporting, public participation and stakeholder representation, us trying to get closer to the communities that we serve, and for us to also see resilience among them. So that's DRRM uh, in general. Now, if you look at the country, the previous presentation uh, presents um, our key challenges moving forward, the RM boys. So we've uh, flagged entry points institution-wise, entry points policy-wise, and entry points grounding-wise. So we have still a lot to do. And although years and years of encountering so much destruction coming from both natural and man-induced disasters uh, should have made us better you know, by now. It seems that we are not learning that much. And evidences show that uh, we need to do a lot more institution-wise for us to better serve the population. So can PES, can Payment for Ecosystem Services support DRR, NCCA, or mitigation and adaptation-related initiatives in the country? I think the presentation earlier points to possibilities in terms of resources that we have to fund interventions, uh, disaster risk reduction, as well as climate change adaptation mitigation-wise. So we've mentioned that we have a lot of sources. 
But uh, we've also mentioned that we have very inefficient ways of mobilizing and using such. So for example, the National DRR Fund shows, that, uh, shows us around 70 to 80% utilization rate. The local DRR Fund shows us around 40% utilization rate on average. So very inefficient way of using what we have right now for DRR-related interventions. And that's uh, counterintuitive since we've been saying that we need more and more resources to put into DRR-related interventions. But we are not using such right now. So we need, we need to do a lot. And then probably a fresher look at this is to involve more our stakeholders, the communities. And I guess PES is one way of doing that. So this is a more novel way for us to engage stakeholders, allow them to participate more, not only in terms of processes and decision-making, but also in terms of them grounding initiatives on the ground. So what are ecosystem services? Uh, we classify them as provisioning services, regulating services, cultural services, support services, ranging from products to recreation, for example, for uh, cultural services, you know, to regulating services. So we, we can have um, a fresher way to address the key points or the key entry points for intervention, the RRM and climate change and adaptation mitigation ones. So we just uh, elaborate more on what these provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services are, from food, water, fuel, fiber, to aesthetics, educational, recreational. So we look at as well possibilities of the tourism sector contributing to, to local resource management, to local mitigation and adaptation related initiatives. So earnings from such or money coming from such going into efforts toward better resilient communities. So for those who are not very much aware of the definition of PES, we have it here. 2005, Wonder defines PES as a voluntary transaction in which an environmental service is bought by buyer uh, from a minimum of one provider, you know, if and only if the provider continues to provide this, this, that service. So that's the conditionality. I think uh, Muradian in 2010 considers uh, a broader way of the application of PES as a concept. So PES as a transfer of resource between social actors which aims to create incentives to align individuals and or collective land use decisions with the social interest in the management of resources. So I think this is, in a way, very much applicable to what we are seeing right now in the country, PES applications. Traditionally, or traditionally, we need to see voluntary transaction. We need to see a well-defined ecosystem service being traded. Buyers, sellers, and of course, the conditionality. But what we have right now, I guess, are PES-like uh, schemes of being adopted by our stakeholders. So what are the motivations for our actors, for sellers? Of course, natural capital protection, IPs, our indigenous peoples continue traditional practices within their domains, local communities to have other sources of livelihood for buyers, you know, for those who want those ecosystem services, access to ecological services, may those be pertaining to water supply, aesthetic values, entertainment, recreation, access to natural capital, or for them to actually disincentivize you know, wrong practices or non-compliance on policy. So we need as well very strong intermediaries. You know, knowledge building and management would be uh, some of the preferred returns coming from our intermediaries. Shared goals and interests, proper resource stewardship and policy compliance. What are the enabling conditions? We have those here. Trust and transparency, capacity to pay and provide service from parties, influential champion as intermediary, well-defined boundaries, baseline data, government structure, clear purpose addressing threats or risks. So 
they also need a lot for PES schemes or arrangements to work. And it's quite difficult to be um, very much aligned to the traditional definition, needing voluntary action. So what we see right now in the country are systems with lesser voluntary action, but more of uh, those um, ask, asking the population or stakeholders to shell out money. May those be as fees, as payments, no, for environmental related services. So as I mentioned, we have PES arrangements, which are traditional in terms of uh, system and coverage. And then PES-like arrangements, those needing uh, more ingredients for them to be called a traditional PES arrangement. For example, those having absences of voluntary transaction and the uh, conditionality requirements. So comparison of PES components in terms of what we have in literature, PES payment schemes, um, public-private, public-private partnership. And then we have from our case studies also added here quasi-public because there are entities operating uh, within the bureaucracy that are supposedly part of government, but uh, they are uh, operating semi-government in terms of character. And then buyer-seller configuration, one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-one, many-to-many, ES packaging, bundling, layering, and piggybacking. Piggybacking, we also added um, in this uh, slide because we see environmental services that are actually being offered free from our supposed uh, providers of service because they are part of the larger scheme of things. So buyers, sellers, providers, intermediaries, I'll just go through very quickly, PS actors and design. Um, payers in terms of payment category, as we see, uh, a lot of what we have right now started with studies to, to peg uh, initial costs of transactions through willingness to pay studies. No? Such are trial and error, and eventually they move or progress with them setting other figures no? in terms of fees and costs. Some do simulation modeling, uh, and specifically those with a bit limited on-site information. And then site-specific quantitative measurements, actual monitoring possible payments can be done for you for those with much more information or data from specific areas. As I mentioned earlier, we based our presentation on several case studies. So we looked at what we are seeing right now, with Subic, the Subic Metropolitan uh, uh, Report Zone. We also looked at the arrangements for the Tubataha Reef Natural Park. And then we engaged with our stakeholders from the Puerto Princesa Subterranean River Natural Park as well. So you see here um, a very concise presentation of what we can expect no, PES application wise. So, PES packaging, piggybacking, layering uh, for, for some of them. Then com possibly uh, us comparing what we are doing now with our neighbor, no, in this case, Vietnam. So buyers of services would be your local households, tourists, and possibly companies trying to uh, get something from the local population. Sellers, government uh, actors, no? indigenous peoples, uh, local population as well, local communities providing services. Intermediaries, those providing oversight. Government, both at the national and subnational level. Uh, INGOs, including in this case for Tobataha, WWF. We have as well NGAs, DNR, LGUs, and certain communities for um, our global counterpart. And in the end, uh, probably in all our case studies, we weren't able to see very uh, traditional approaches to PES application. So a lot of them are PES like. Well, aside from our case studies, we also see a lot of uh, local grounding of PES. For example, you go to Negros Occidental, uh, you see applications in San Carlos City, in Bago City. In mountain province in the north, from uh, the municipality of Bauco, 
in the southern Philippines as well, Samis Oriental, Cagayan de Oro Seco. So we, we have a lot of local applications of PDS. More noble way for us to source financing for local initiatives. We just have to have very interested parties, no? both the seller of ecosystem service and then the buyer uh, who are willing to pay, as well as, of course, our oversight, you know, the intermediary, which can be government or an outside entity from government. So very quickly as well, our case studies, Big Bay, Freeport Zone, uh, inception, 1992, start of PES 2014. So if you go to Subic, you check in one of their hotels, you will see from the charge slip an environmental fee. You know. That's usually around 100. So that money goes into a fund that uh, they use for local natural resource management. If you go to Palawan, where the Princess Underground River, you know, we see, uh, I think, a uh, very well sustained operation, also coming from a PES like arrangement. So you have buyers, which possibly are your local public or tourists from both local and international uh, origin, sellers of the uh, environmental service coming from your IPs. So they are earning a lot. The local communities are uh, augmenting their livelihoods because of a PES-like arrangement. In the process, sustaining local management initiatives and maintaining the ecological integrity of the area. The same is true with Tubataha. So this was actually initiated with WWF and they set an initial fee based uh, on a study, a willingness to pay study, but then eventually moves the amount you know, given what they were seeing on field. So this is an arrangement that is also quasi-government in nature because uh, like what we have in Puerto Princesa, the Tubataha uh, Reef Management is also uh, supposedly part of government, but, but they are uh, operating uh, on a semi-government character capacity. So just relating again to what we want to see uh, traditionally for PES, um, we don't see voluntary transaction from our case study sites. And there is that item of conditionality also being uh, a concern. But uh, these are PES-like arrangements. And probably it's a way for us to have systems that are locally appropriate for them to be more sustainable functioning wise and for them to actually be viable uh, in so many dimensions. So just to organize our, our thoughts with regard to arrangements that we see from our case study sites. So you have your buyers, you have your sellers and you have your intermediaries. The intermediaries may be non-government actors they may be from the government, from the national government agencies, as well as LGUs. They may be international development organizations. And in the end, those who provide the ecosystem services are also possibly coming from the communities, local stakeholders, volunteers, government and quasi-government uh, entities, non-government organizations, and those paying may be coming from your local tourists, general public, fisheries, uh, and other patrons. So a system that is quite possibly easy to grasp, but very difficult to, to ground. For something like this to be sustainable, you need to, to check a lot of boxes. So what are the learnings that we've seen from our case studies locally? PES is a good platform for financial and operational sustainability. So we are seeing uh, the underground river ecosystem being managed well because of PES-like related schemes. We are seeing the proper management of Tubata Harif because of a PES-like arrangement. Country lacks a definitive national policy and framework on PES, but enabling provisions are lodged in several policies. Active engagement and collaboration with IPs and local communities increases onboarding, you know, ownership among communities with uh, PES-like arrangements going forward. 
private and CSO NGO support facilitate self-sustaining arrangements without government resource. So PS or PS-like arrangements and can move forward outside government or bureaucratic oversight. Legal basis instrumental in enforcing conditionality need to be strengthened. There are arbitrary basis for fee setting and lease, no? So pricing or cost-wise, we need to have a way to standardize no? PS-related uh, interventions or schemes. Weak legal enforcement towards damages, no standard compensation blueprint. Agreements fall through without appropriate performance metrics and such compromise the stability and sustainability of PS-like arrangements. What are the other key takeaways? There are a lot of negotiation bottlenecks because you have to have a meeting of the mind between your sellers of PS-related services or ecosystems-related services and your sellers and your, your, your buyers from the other end. And such is facilitated by a very strong intermediary. May that be government or an entity outside the bureaucracy. Management and fiscal limitations. So we have a lot. Complementation and capacity building in initiatives, government accounting, auditing rules, and ES payment restructuring. So this is a concern for, for some because we are dealing with money. And how do you account for that or audit that if you bring it in the public system? Transparency and uh, monitoring and evaluation checks. So if you're also dealing with resources, with money, you need to be very transparent and you need to have so many checks. Facilitation of buyer and seller interaction is also very much required. Missing policies and institutions, looking at PES. So we have a lot of actually local policies that touch a bit on PES related schemes, but uh, we need a broader set of provisions that would allow us to institutionalize or mainstream PES within our systems as an alternative option for sustainable finance. So weak sustainability measures, data and availability, evolving definition of PES as well, which is very good. That's why we, we actually conducted the PES study. We wanted to have a basis to, for us to say that this is PES, that it, this is PES-like, and there are entry points for improvements as such. No? So um, we are in the process of trying to evolve from the very traditional PES definition to a more locally applicable or nationally applicable version of such. Other ways forward, capitalize on evolving PES definition and increased interest from government and outside stakeholders. So not only the government looking at PES, but also our um, extra government counterparts being very much interested in PES-related schemes now for operational sustainability. And I guess the recent PDP that we have, the Philippine Development Plan uh, of the current administration, also touches on PES as uh, an alternative modality. Replicate success, PES and ecotourism with natural capital management and ecological integrity initiatives. Link PES to natural capital management and DRR, CCA, CCM efforts. Augment accounting and auditing policy to reflect PES and natural capital accounts. Institute PES transparency platform and data management. Explore performance-based M&E. Incentivize mitigation adaptation shift from dole out grants, user-based to exchange-based approaches like PES. Increase buy-in of the private sector for them to, to actually shell out resources for that arrangement. Study sustainable financing schemes, clear transaction and opportunity costs, frame sustainable PS templates, and pursue legal platform for PES and NGA at, at the national and subnational levels. So a big concern is the voluntary versus compliance payment that uh, we are seeing from local PES-like arrangements. Voluntary being absent in so many of those arrangements. And I think this is the last slide. Payment for ecosystem services as a fiscally viable and sustainable scheme for DRR, CCA, uh, and mitigation and uh, initiatives. 
may be considered no, as an alternative approach for us to have uh, better funded, more fiscally sustainable initiatives on the ground. So with that, we thank you for, for listening.